Hey there, art nerds. So I have three paper craft activities for you guys this year. Today, I'm going to show you how to make the first of those three, a snowball fight between Kara and Tanner. I'm going to start by walking you guys through the sketching, the inking, and the watercolor process. Before I even started sketching this project though, I came up with a couple of thumbnails to get the basic idea down. I thought it would be really cute to create a somewhat interactive or interactive seeming scene between two of my paper craft paper children. So this is kind of a two for paper craft activity. If you're one of my amazing art nerds on Patreon, I've already shared the line art and the printable watercolor illustration with you guys. So I am working on a Canson XL watercolor paper. I already showed you guys the two little post-it thumbnails that I created to get the basic gesture. And is it just me or has Canson started putting their watercolor paper in the pads backwards? This will come up in a moment. I had to discard a whole sketch because I sketched it on the back of the watercolor paper and I find that it just doesn't handle as nicely as the front. So the reason I'm working on Canson XL watercolor paper is one, it's pretty affordable. You used to be able to find it just about anywhere, although Walmart doesn't seem to be carrying it anymore. You can still find it on Amazon and at Michael's. It's a cellulose or wood pulp based watercolor paper that's pretty economical, but yet it handles watercolor, pencils, and ink pretty well. And that's all really important. So I'm starting out with Kara since I draw her all the time. I know her proportions the best. And then I'm drawing a couple of guidelines over and referencing not only my thumbnail, but I also also have reference online pulled up of kids having a snowball fight although frankly it's full of clip art and not necessarily as full of photo reference as I would like and I start by doing kind of a skeletal figure of the characters to get the gesture to get the form and to get the placement and the height all accurate and correct so I started with Kara as kind of my template and I'm basing Tanner's proportion since he's a little bit older than Kara off of my existing sketch. And I haven't really fleshed anything out yet. This is called volumetric drawing where I'm taking the figure and I'm breaking it down into some really basic 3D volumetric forms. And if you're interested, I've got some great tutorials on how to do that here on the channel that I'll try to remember to link for you guys. So once I have the basic forms sketched out, I can start dressing them. And as I've mentioned in many of my tutorials, I really like working from reference when it comes to designing characters. So I've pulled up some winter wear reference from several different sites and put together an outfit for Kara that I think both looks like something a Lilliputian or a tiny seven inch child would wear, as well as something Kara herself would wear. So I'm sketching everything in using a mechanical pencil with HB lead in it. While wooden pencils are a little bit better, a little bit more flexible for your hands, I wouldn't say better overall, just better for your hand health. I find that working with a plastic mechanical pencil is kind of the best of both worlds. I don't have to stop and break my train of thought to sharpen the pencil. I always have a sharp pencil handy, but I would rather break the pencil than break my hand. So I use plastic pencils and I have a whole series of reviews of mechanical pencils across a variety of price points if you're interested in seeing if there's a mechanical pencil that works well for you. So when I'm drawing, I always start with the largest blocked in forms, trying to break it down to the simplest version of the shape. And then I, after I've kind of placed everything, I spend my time refining from there because you don't want to spend a lot of time drawing in details that you're just going to have to erase because you find that it doesn't really work. And for Tanner's winter wear, I'm going very Viking inspired. So if you are new here, hi, welcome. I'm a comic artist and illustrator and I make the web comic 7 Inch Kara and you can read it for totally freezies at 7inchkara.com. It's a story of a Lilliputian or super tiny 7 inch tall little girl named Kara who has discovered that the huge secret her parents have been keeping for all of her life, the secret that humans are actually real, is a total lie. And she sets out to adventure and meet a human before her parents whisk her away deep into the woods where she'll never have a chance to meet any humans at all. And I love 
playing in this kind of miniature world sandbox. I've always been really into miniatures. I like creating miniatures. I've always liked imagining what life would be at that scale. So not only do I spend a lot of time thinking about that when I'm working on 7-inch Kara, but I also have a yearly art challenge, Lilliputian Living, where I really explore that diminutive world building. And I do that once a year during October. I do 31 days of that world building and then I collect all of that into a zine and I share it. So if you're interested, I actually have the first four years available as a compendium stupendium on my shop, natasoup.com slash shop. I'll have links to all that down in the description below. So once I finish penciling both illustrations, I can start inking and I'm inking with a Sakura Pigma FB that has a jelly grip put on to it just for, you know, better hand health. I do have early onset arthritis, so I try to take care of my hands and I try not to damage them much more than I'm already in for. And this is a great waterproof and alcohol marker safe brush pen. You can find these almost everywhere. They sell them at Michael's. If you can't find it, the Tombo Furenosuke is also alcohol marker and water safe and they sell those at Walmart and they are great. Although the brush on those is a little bit stiffer than the brush on the Sakura Pigma FB. So if you're heavier handed and you're more used to technical pins and you'd like to try inking with a brush pin, the Tombo Furenosuke is a great choice for you. But if you're already very familiar with brush pins or you're lighter handed or you want something softer that can give you some really nice bouncy lines with a variety of line weights, the Sakura Pigma FB is a great choice. And I'm working with a sheet of copy paper underneath my hand. That's just to prevent my hand from smearing the graphite or from getting potential hand grease or hand oils onto the paper since I am going to be painting on it. I don't want any of that to possibly cause a resist with my watercolors. So now that Kara is inked, we can move on to Tanner. And I have some really great tutorials on how to ink here on the channel where I really walk you guys through my process. But basically when I'm thinking about line weight, so with these brush pins, the lighter you pull, the finer and more delicate your lines. The heavier you press, the heavier your lines are going to be. So when I'm thinking about line weight, I'm thinking about the mass, the weight of the object. So a feather would have a lighter line weight than a rock. It gives it this light, airy, almost ethereal feeling. Objects closer to a light source are going to have a lighter line weight than objects further away from a, the light source because that gives it a sense of shadow, shading, and depth. And the areas on an object that are closer to the light source are going to have a thinner 
line weight than the areas further away from the light source. So we've got both, both like proximity to the light source for the object itself and then proximity to the light source on the individual objects. And then it, it depends on how close the object is to the viewer. So if I'm inking a comic page, objects that are really close to the viewer are going to have a heavier line weight and that kind of helps create some staging that creates our foreground our middle ground and our background for objects or i'm sorry for illustrations that are going to be colored i also leave my line work what i call open so i don't fill in areas with black when you fill in an area with black or shade an entire object with black that's called spot blacks so I typically, for things that are going to be painted or colored with markers or digitally rendered, I leave a lot of white areas, light areas. I keep my line work really light and airy compared to what I would do if it was going to just be black and white. And you can really see that with some of my Lilliputian living illustrations because since those are initially designed for black and white, I do a lot more texture and shading and creating shadows and creating values using the inks themselves. But for these paper children, we're going to cut these out and paint them. So I leave my line works open. So I allowed my line work, my line art to dry for 24 hours. And then I erased my pencils using a white vinyl eraser. I happen to like the Pentel high polymer erasers. And then I went ahead and I scanned these color corrected them and shared them over on my Patreon. So now we can actually print the or paint the originals. So I'm taping them both down to a piece of gator board. That's just plastic signboard like you see during, you know, voting season. Um, so honestly, if you get a bunch of those in your yard, you now know that you can use them for watercolor unless you're YouTubing it and you don't want to pr promote the candidate. And usually with my watercolor illustrations, I would go ahead and stretch them. I have tutorials on how you can stretch your watercolor illustrations. But for this, I just taped it down and I secured it just to kind of prevent it from buckling all over the place. So since Kara and Tanner are having a snowball fight, I wanted to actually include some snow as part of their bases. So you guys know I live in Southeast Louisiana. We get snow like once every 20 years. Snow is a really rare occurrence down here. And when it does snow, you don't get a whole lot of snow. Fortunately, Kara and Tanner are only like seven inches tall. So even a little bit of snow is enough for them to have a snowball fight. Can you guys imagine how big snowflakes must be for them? It must be amazing for them. Speaking of, I have two more paper craft activities for you guys for the holiday season. I have an ice princess and then I have a wintry foliage paper child paper craft. And I hope you guys are looking forward to those because I sure am looking forward to sharing them with you guys. So I am painting with my core mini palette. This is the same palette that I use for all the paper child paper craft activities. It allows me to keep the colors fairly consistent. It also allows me to do a bit of painting shorthand. If I had my daily driver watercolor palette with all 48 pans in there, I might be tempted to try way more complicated things than I really need for a project like this. The most complicated technique that I'm really using is wet into wet, as you guys saw with the snow, where I applied a really light wash of ultramarine blue. And then while it was still wet, working in segments because cellulose paper really can't take a lot of water. You got to kind of be patient with it. I dabbed in a thicker mix of ultramarine blue and I love ultramarine blue because it's such a beautiful warm blue and it granulates out in such a beautiful way. I think it works really well for the snow. The other big techniques that I'm using for this are layering. So that's very simple. You see me doing it right now. I'm just layering another layer of the same skin tone, which is just burnt sienna with a whole lot of water in it on top of my first layer after the first layer has dried. And this can be a very easy watercolor technique that's used to build up your form, your color, and your contrast. And it doesn't have to be the same color over and over again. Layering can be layering a new color on top of it. Layering and glazing are pretty similar. Glazing is typically a really thin version of the color, a really desaturated version of the color, a lot of water without a lot of paint mixed into it. Whereas layering can be glazing or layering can be much thicker washes. So 
Layering is kind of like the overall catch-all term and glazing is a little bit more specific. But they're two of the techniques that I use all the time when it comes to watercolor illustration. So another technique that I use is washing out where I apply the color and then I rinse out my brush and I have clean water in the brush and I apply that to the paper to kind of soften that layer, to soften that transition. So if you want a sharper line, if you want a sharper delineation between the two colors, or it doesn't matter as much like in the case with these skin tones for Kara and Tanner, then I don't bother to do a washout or a blend out. But if I want a softer transition like on Kara's skirt, or I want to lighten the color a little bit, I'll add in some water like that. Now, since these two are out in a snowy winter wonderland, I want to give them like lots of blush, lots of flush to their cheeks. And for this skin tone, alizarin crimson is a beautiful color for that. The core alizarin crimson is just such a beautiful, peachy sort of red color and it washes out with water really prettily and it has a really nice natural blush sort of look. So it's a color that I use pretty frequently. And if you're interested in learning more about this palette, and I use this palette all of the time, I have an unboxing swatch and field test review that'll give you guys a little bit more information about the Core Mini palette. But I highly recommend it. I believe it was like my top 10 of 2018. And it's still one of the palettes that I recommend to people who are interested in watercolor and they don't necessarily want to mess around with student grade watercolor and struggle with student watercolors. They want to invest their money and get something that they're going to really like and be happy with right off the bat. And the Core Mini palette is that for me. I really like the palette, especially if you paint smaller like I do. It's a great fit. It travels well. It doesn't take up a lot of space. You get 12 colors, but they're all very mixable. They're all very usable. It's just a great palette, both for beginners and for more experienced watercolor artists. So what I'm doing is what I refer to as painting in batch and that's when I'm working on at least two watercolor illustrations at the same time and I'm kind of using the same colors that I've already mixed. I'm kind of painting every so like I would paint Kara's skin tone and then I'd paint Tanner's skin tone and then I do Kara's blush and then I do Tanner's blush and what's good about this is it allows me to work really quickly. This is the secret to me painting a watercolor comic. I don't paint one page at a time. I paint anywhere from two to six pages at a time. And I've actually got some great comic tutorials here on the channel for you guys. And I also have some great how to watercolor for comic tutorials for you guys. And I'm really hoping that this year, going into 2022, I can start working on comics again and really focus on that because I really, really miss it. But life has just been so super hectic with COVID and moving and Hurricane Ida and reestablishing myself in a new town that I haven't really had a chance to really focus on sitting down and writing and thumbnailing and drawing and painting comics. But I'm hoping that 2022 doesn't throw any more curveballs. Calm, calm yourself, 2022, and that I can actually get back to making comics again. So although you can choose to paint Kara and Tanner however you wish with whatever colors you want, or you can just take inspiration from this tutorial and use this to create your own paper child paper crafts, I wanted to go with colors that felt very wintry, kind of Christmassy without necessarily being overtly Christmassy. And also something that just felt like something these characters would wear. So Kara's outfit is primarily reds, grays, and cream with a green accent. And Tanner's outfit is kind of the opposite of Kara's outfit. So in the core mini palette, I wouldn't say we necessarily have like a good true red, but you can mix a good true red or a closer approximation of that by mixing your alizarin crimson with your quin magenta. So that's the pink right next to it. And that'll give you more of like what we think of as a red. And if you want more scarlet notes, there is pyrrole orange right next to the alizarin crimson that you can mix in. And that's going to give you kind of more of a fire engine sort of red. The only thing I find that this palette isn't really the strongest at is a good red violet. There is a dioxine violet all the way over 
at the end of the first row, but it has a tendency to take over anything that you add it to. It is a very, very assertive color. So I wasn't really able to get as nice of shading on the reds in these two paper crafts as I would have liked. So if you would like to work on this at home and you're one of my patrons over on Patreon, and if you're not, you can join me and get access to these printables and more right now for just $2 a month at patreon.com slash soup. But if you want to work along at home and you want to color along at home, what I would recommend you do is print on at least cardstock, if not a 90 pound watercolor paper or Bristol. Bristol would be great if you want to do this with alcohol markers. And I would print it using a toner based printer. So the kind of printers that they have at libraries, that they have at Office Max. Um, some people have their own. I have my own because I use them for printing out zines. It's a little bit more economical than an inkjet printer. If you're using an inkjet printer, the thing to keep in mind is that the ink is going to be more likely to be water soluble. So while you can alcohol marker on top of it, you cannot necessarily watercolor on top of it. Of course, I have a hack for that. I have what I call my magic disappearing blue lines technique. And I've talked about that in a lot of videos. It's one of the secrets of my success when it comes to watercolor comics, it really is like a magic trick because you can work, you can do all your drawing, all your sketching digitally, which is typically what I like to do. I like to do it in Photoshop because I can kind of rearrange things and it makes the process a lot quicker, but it's not as, not as nice to record. So that's why I don't share a lot of my digital art with you guys on here, but I will draw it and sketch it, refine it digitally, print it out using my magic blue line printing technique, pencil it, and then either ink it or stretch it as is and the water dissolves the blue lines and it just leaves the pencils or the inks making it look like I just magicked it up out of nowhere. So you guys can see for these paper craft illustrations, it's really just a lot of layering and waiting for it to dry and layering and waiting for it to dry. And it really, it, it took a couple of hours to paint this. So it really wasn't too bad. And even though I live in Southeast Louisiana where it is incredibly humid, I figured out a way to get the paper to dry a lot quicker. And that is to have a whole house dehumidifier running because that's going to pull a lot of the moisture out of the air. So it means that the moisture on the paper can actually escape into the atmosphere, allowing your paints to dry quicker. Now I could use a hairdryer. That's like one of the big things people are always like, why don't you use a hairdryer? Well, I don't use a hairdryer for a lot of reasons, frankly. One, if I was working with masking fluid, it would cause the masking fluid to permanently affix to my paper, which is not what I want my masking fluid to do. Two, frankly, I have sensory issues and I hate the noise of a hairdryer. So while I have one and I do use one for art on occasion, it's definitely not something I would want to grab often. It just causes me this extreme discomfort. And when it comes to art, I really recommend you don't spend all your time being uncomfortable if you can possibly help it. I've also found that using a hairdryer can sometimes cause professional grade watercolors to behave like much cheaper watercolors. It can cause these sort of white blooms. It can also push the pigment into areas where you don't want the pigment to be. And I've found that the uneven dry times when I use a hair dryer can sometimes cause my watercolor paper to bickle to buckle and kip, almost said bickle, to buckle and kip worse than it would if I just let it dry naturally. So my solution is to turn on the dehumidifier. If I'm working in a room with a fan, turn on the fan and that gets the air circulating, but I don't point the fan directly at my watercolor paper because like I said, I don't want it to push the water. And uh, just try to be patient with it. Now. Some of the people who recommend that I use a hairdryer have very different experiences with it and it works really well for them. So it's definitely a your mileage may vary sort of situation. It may have a lot to do with your own tolerances and the climate that you live in and the paper that you're painting on. If I were working on a cotton rag watercolor paper, that actually absorbs a lot of the water. Whereas with these cellulose papers, the water sits on the paper's surface until it has a chance to dry. So a cotton rag paper handles 
using a hairdryer a lot better than a cheaper cellulose paper does. So why am I using a cellulose paper when I know a cotton rag paper could be a lot better? I've actually found that for this type of illustration, if I'm directly sketching on the paper surface, cellulose paper tends to handle sketching a lot better. Pencil leads can kind of cut into the surface of my cellulose or my cotton rag watercolor paper, can kind of dig in, mark it up, scuff it up. So when I'm erasing the pencils, I can't erase them fully. It leaves a lot of ghosting and even erasing can really tear up the paper surface. So I save my cotton rag watercolor paper for, you know, when I'm not going to be doing so much erasing. So either using my blue line technique or I'm painting directly from reference, not something where there's going to be a lot of trial and error and correcting mistakes. I, this is also a very economical paper that is pretty commonly found. You don't have to go searching for it. It's not going to break the bank. So I find that it's nice to have a few cheaper papers and do a few tutorials with cheaper papers because my goal is to help you guys make art a habit. And one of the ways I can do that is by making art and art supplies more accessible. And that sometimes means demonstrating how to work with cheaper art supplies. So now that the basic watercolor illustration is completed, I'm going in with some white gouache. And if you don't know, gouache is just a more opaque watercolor. So it's a water soluble medium and I can use the same brushes and I can dispose of it the same way. I'm using white gouache just to add in a few highlights here and there. And I really find that this adds a lot of liveliness. It also allows me to adjust the contrast. So if my illustration is starting to maybe look a little bit too dark, sometimes adding white gouache can really help liven it up. And you don't have to limit yourself to white gouache. If you wanna go mix media, you can use all different colors of gouache to add accents, to add patterns, to add highlights. The, the world is your oyster. I just happen not to do that because I don't know, even though I'm like mad about watercolor, I love watercolor, I'm crazy for it. I don't necessarily want a lot of gouache sitting around on my table either. So I wanted to give the impression of snow and falling snow and the snowball fight. So I'm splattering some watered down gouache on top of Kara and Tanner. I allow that to dry absolutely fully and completely. And now it's time to remove them from their constraints. So pulling my 3M blue painters tape away at a 90 degree angle, I'm able to remove the tape without tearing into the illustration. And that is the watercolor tutorial segment of our paper child paper craft. So next I'm gonna show you guys how to assemble these into adorable standees. So in addition to my paper children, the materials that I'm using for this tutorial are double sticks tape, single sided tape, scissors, an X-Acto knife, some coins, some pom poms and some Eileen's tacky glue. And I want to start by removing and saving the excess paper. And although I showed you guys like I'm snipping it, I actually used a paper cutter for this because I want really, really straight lines for that because I'm going to be using those to build the base. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove all the small islands of white using an X-Acto blade to really get in there. Now, if you have a Cricut and you know how to do this or a silhouette or any of those cutting machines and you know how to scan something and select what you want to keep and what you want to get rid of, use the Cricut. I have a Cricut. I should be using it for these activities. Use the Cricut. It's so much quicker and easier on your hands. And if you wanted to do a bunch of these or do them as a class project or a library project, the Cricut would be better. So next I'm taking off big chunks of watercolor paper. I'm also going to save these because I'm going to use these to add structure and to create the base. So I'm kind of just cutting loosely around it. Now, if you're not good at cutting and you don't have a Cricut, you can leave a white halo around it. It's not that big a deal. I have a bunch of paper child paper crafts where I did leave the white around it. It's not the end of the world. And then finally, I'm cutting off the base. So it looks pretty good so far. She is so, so cute. These turned out so cute this year. Oh my goodness. Sometimes I forget that when I'm like in the middle of working on it, I get so caught up that I forget to look at my art and be like, you know what? I like this. This makes me happy. But it's really important to do that because if you don't, you're going to be so likely to get burnt out. I hate that it's kind of a trend to hate your own art. Like it's one thing to say, hey, my work 
needs improvement. These are the areas I want to focus on. And there's another to just wholesale hate your own art. Like I think for anyone who wants to make art consistently long term, aka making art a habit, you have to like your art. You have to get some pleasure from the creation. You have to get some pleasure out of the thing that you've made. Otherwise, you're kind of just turning yourself into a draw robot and you're not really getting anything out of it. And I've lived that life and it is a very sad, depressing life, very prone to burnout. So I try to make it a point to like step back and appreciate my art as a fan of my own art. That doesn't mean you have a big ego. It doesn't mean you think you're better than other artists. But if you can't appreciate and enjoy your own art, then when times are lean and times are tough and you're not making much money or you're not getting compliments on it, you're going to burn out and feel very depressed. we have both paper children cut out it's time to grab our reserved watercolor pieces some popsicle sticks some single-sided tape some double stick tape I also have some foam tape here but you don't actually need the foam tape and pretty much everything but the pom-poms were purchased at Dollar Tree so you can get the supplies you need for this paper craft very cheaply and you don't have to use coins the coins are a counterbalance weight you could actually use rocks so I'm using these popsicle sticks to add a lot of structural stability very quickly and I'm using double stick tape rather than glue because glue has a tendency to as it's absorbed by the paper it makes the paper start to buckle and kip a little bit and it can cause warping so I found that in general using double stick tape or a tape runner is just a better way to go about this and you don't have the paper warping on you and this is particularly true if you've printed this out onto thinner papers like a cardstock that's going to be way more prone to buckling Now, there are some quick dry glues that would probably work really well for this, but the double stick tape is just very easy to use and I don't get it all over my hands and all over my table. I'm also cutting down the popsicle sticks when they're a little bit too large. So these are really large ones. These are like tongue depressor size popsicle sticks. Um, The smaller ones also work really well. I used those in last year's Paper Craft Miss activities. If you haven't checked that out, I created 14 days worth of paper craft activities and shared them freely on the internet. So now we're making our base and I use that, I do that by using the scraps, the long straight cut scraps to create a triangle. And for some really good stability, I overlap two of them on the edge that isn't long enough to actually be an end. And not only do I double stick tape them together, but then I use the single sided tape to just really secure it. And one of the things about these paper child paper craft activities is these things are pretty secure. They're definitely going to last the holiday season, especially if you don't mess with them too, too much. But even if you live in a really humid area like I do, once they fall apart or you know things start to fall off they're very easy to fix with just a little bit of tape and a little bit of time and patience and frankly mine fell apart because when I moved I did not store them very well at all and I had to kind of fix a bunch of things so we have this triangular base built out of paper I'm just kind of double engineering it I'm going to tape it both using double stick tape and using single sided tape. I'm trimming it first just to make sure it's not visible from, not super visible from the front. You don't have to do that. You could even color your base if you want to. So I'm using double stick tape to secure this to the paper figure. Now, if you have something that's a little like, like super glue would probably be a really good choice here. I'm just that person who gets, if I mess with glue, I get glue everywhere, all over my hands. So I, I prefer tape myself, but if you're a model person and you're super good with glue, then feel free to use your super glue to glue some of these segments together. And I'm just securing it even more, really engineering it with some double side or single sided tape. Would you guys believe that when I was a kid, we had a stationary center in our kindergarten classroom and I got fussed at for wasting paper and tape? 
Who knew? So you can also use the watercolor paper scraps to, instead of using the popsicle sticks for thinner areas to create a support. And I'm basically triple stacking my watercolor paper scraps and using double stick tape in between the layers and then double stick taping them to my paper figure. So on Tanner's legs, it's really important just to have some extra structure, some extra paper there. Same goes for the arm that's waving, well, waving now, he's gonna be throwing a snowball. So I'm creating triple stacks of my scrap watercolor paper just to give it some extra support. And you could use a bit of wire there. You could use twigs from the yard there. It doesn't have to be paper and popsicle sticks. You can use, uh, pipe cleaners would actually be great for this. So to make sure these don't tip over, I'm creating a bottom to my base and using my scrap watercolor paper, I'm just taping it. And for here, it's like a preliminary tape. So I, I taped it long ways using the single sided tape. And then here's another piece of single sided tape. And then I'm gonna over engineer it by taping it on the inside and taping it along the edges. You you totally do not have to go overkill with this. I, I do because I keep them. Um, since these are original watercolor illustrations and it's nice to be able to like, you know, put them in different poses and use them for different things. In fact, I used several of the paper children that I designed in the seven inch Kara volume two Kickstarter video. So I don't know. I just love being able to bring these tiny people into the real world. So for my weight to make sure it's not top heavy, I'm taping a stack of quarters together two ways with the single sided tape. And then I put some double sided tape on the bottom and just tape it there at the far end of the triangle to make sure sure that it doesn't, you know, flop over. You definitely don't have to use coins for this. You can use any small weights that work well for you. So finally, we get to mess around with the pom-poms. And this is the only time I'm going to be using glue for this. And this is Eileen's Tacky Glue. I got this at Dollar Tree as well. A quick dry glue, if you're impatient, would be best. But you can probably even use like Elmer's glue for this. So one of the nice things about the tacky glue though is it does become tacky quickly so it'll at least stick to the hands. And I put Kara and Tanner face down just to apply a little bit of pressure from the hand to the little pom-pom snowball just to make sure that it sticks really well. And I'm also going to add some pom-pom snowballs down to the bottom to make it look like Kara's got a pile of snowballs at the ready to throw. Same thing for Tanner, put it face down so it applies a little bit of weight to it. And these pom-poms are just so cute. They have like little bits of glitter in them and like little bits of extra fur. And since I didn't have any snow at home, I had to go store-bought, it's fine. I'm also using some of the bigger pom-poms piled up on the side behind them just to kind of add a three-dimensional element and to really sell the whole like snowball fight sort of aspect. So a quicker drying glue would really be helpful here, um, mostly because what I don't show you guys is the dry times and how long I'm letting them dry. And I'm a pretty impatient person, so I let them only dry for 30 minutes, but the longer you let them dry, the more secure it'll be. And here we have our adorable, completed paper craft paper children. We have Kara and Tanner having a snowball fight. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was made possible thanks to my amazing patrons and hopefully I'll see you guys soon with another art supply review tutorial or paper craft. Have a great day guys. Bye!